It's something that a lot of people will experience at some point in their lives. The need to borrow money for a big purchase. Maybe it's for a new car. Perhaps it's to build or upgrade a home. When it comes to large institutions such as banks, insurers, hedge funds and publicly traded companies, borrowing follows a simple, similar pattern. An application followed by a review by the bank, then an approval and finally the money into your account. What happens when there's a need for larger amounts of money for much bigger things? Who do governments and institutions approach to loan money for the construction of massive infrastructure projects that take years to complete and cost hundreds of millions of dollars? These needs are served by what some call the largest industry you've never heard of, export finance. It's a market that's been around for over a hundred years and while it continues to help fund major infrastructure projects around the globe, it is also undergoing a rapid transformation in line with the urgent need for sustainability. Welcome to Future Impact, an Investec focused radio podcast series that brings you stories of people and organizations contributing to solving South Africa's most pressing sustainability challenges. In this episode, we are talking about export finance, what it is, how it works, and why. As a financial vehicle, it's particularly well suited to contributing towards the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. We will be chatting to Investec's Chris Mitman and Brian Irvine, as well as Hussein Sefian, the CEO of Acre Impact Capital, an investment management firm whose infrastructure projects across the African continent aim to deliver financial returns while simultaneously focusing on environmental and social impact. My name is Seven Zilin Gambole, and this is Investec Future Impact, Episode 7. We begin our conversation with an export finance veteran. My name is Chris Mitman. I'm head of export and agency finance in Investec Bank. Chris begins by unpacking some of the mystery behind the market. When you ask people, do you know what export finance is? They say no. So to give you a clue, it's around $250 billion a year as a market. That's roughly the same as all the multilateral development banks put together. And largely, the finance is focused on delivering essential infrastructure into developing markets. The essential infrastructure that Chris is referring to includes things such as roads, power stations, civil engineering works, and, as we'll find out a little later in this episode, hospitals. Far from being a simple money-lending market, there are a few things that set export credit apart from other sources of capital. What's unique about it is it's, it's inverse to most types of credit. It's available, most fundamentally available, in times of trouble when most bankers wouldn't be seen for dust. Export credit finance is available through the cycle, which means as every borrower, every market goes through a credit cycle, good times and bad. Export finance is sometimes described as a counter-cyclical play. Another good example that sets them out from other sources of capital is they offer longer tenors for poorer markets. That's inverse to most banking principles. So these guys will give you longer to repay if you need longer to repay. And that really improves affordability for credit markets, which are perhaps a struggle to get longer repayment periods due to their, their credit rating. Now is a good time for a quick explanation of the mechanics of export finance. Essentially, a company that wants to develop infrastructure internationally approaches a bank such as Investec, who then mediates between the export credit agency and the project sponsor or borrower and helps structure the deals that ultimately result in the capital being provided. Perhaps surprisingly, export credit agencies are government-owned institutions and their sole mandate is to support exporters from their home countries to trade internationally. The players in the export finance market have traditionally been governments and banks. However, in this new world, even this century-old way of doing things is shifting. My name is Hussein Safia and I'm a founding partner at Acre Impact Capital. Acre Impact Capital is the first fund of its kind in the world 
and invests in climate-aligned essential infrastructure in emerging markets by partnering with leading commercial lenders and export credit agencies. Hussein explains how Acre is doing things in a new way. Banks have mainly been involved in this market and dominated this market. What Acre Impact Capital is doing through its export finance funds is really opening that asset class to institutional investors and allowing them to get exposure to that asset class through the fund. And we're the only fund of its nature looking at the export finance market. And in recognition of the innovative nature of the fund, we've received the support of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Private Infrastructure Development Group, which is a development finance institution owned by five European countries, the IFC and the Australian government. Explicitly linked to the fund, is a focus on impact. The fund focuses on four impact themes. So the first is renewable power, so solar, wind, small hydro type projects. The second thematic is what we call health, food, and water scarcity. So hospitals, clinics, any infrastructure that provides access to clean water to otherwise underserved populations. And in the food space, projects that support food security and so on. Our third thematic is sustainable cities, which is quite a broad thematic, but that includes low-income housing, educational facilities. It could include climate adaptation infrastructure in cities. So, for example, storm drainage infrastructure and the like. And finally, our fourth thematic is green transportation. So here we're looking at public rail projects, public buses, and where we can make a case for uh, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, then we would look at the upgrade of road infrastructure. And as an impact manager, what we really look at is that combination of high impact and making sure that ultimately the infrastructure that's being financed will deliver services to otherwise underserved populations and financial returns. And and I think what's unique about this fund is we work in collaboration with banks like Investec, where Investec and Chris does all the hard work in terms of structuring the transaction and all the hard yards around that. And we come in as a funder on a part of the financing, typically 15% of the value of the transaction. The institutional investors that Acre Impact Capital serves include the likes of development finance institutions, pension funds, insurance companies, and impact-focused family offices. Hussein explains why there's a growing demand for Acre's unique services. So what's interesting is that there's demand both on the investor side and on the project side. But on the investor side, you know, there's been a big trend for institutional investors and others to really think about investing with a lot more intentionality. You would have seen many investors making pledges around climate commitments and looking at various paths to net zero. And and a lot of investors are therefore creating allocations for impact investing and thinking very deeply around how can their uh, capital be used for positive environmental and social impacts. So really you know, one of the key drivers of Acre Impact Capital is to work with these types of investors to help them channel capital towards the most impactful projects across the African continent. For Chris, what makes Acre's efforts laudable is the fact that they are influencing the very large and very old export finance industry at a critical time. It's super exciting to see Acre enter the market at a time when the delivery of the SDGs has never been more urgent. There's two things Acre is doing. One is leading the conversation around sustainability and SDG delivery in the market. They're actually leading the conversation. So the market is very, very excited, like children at a birthday party with lots of Coca-Cola and cake, running around very excited about sustainability, but have no idea how to channel this excitement. And Acre is there helping channel that and deliver. So this is what you need to do. This is what you need to look at. This is how you classify deals. And you you can't just say everything is great when it's not. You have to responsibly classify stuff. Otherwise, you'd be accused of greenwashing or social washing. So it's it's a great initiative, but it goes well beyond what the fund will actually fund. It was, it's an influence in the whole $250 billion industry and its move towards sustainability, which is really exciting. The second thing that Acre is succeeding at, according to Chris, is making the process of export credit finance more streamlined and more efficient. If you look at the combination of people financing deals in Africa, 
You've got you've got IFC, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, China. You, you've got a variety of different multilateral development bank and export credit agency players. And even within one country, those efforts are not that well coordinated because it's it's organizational imperfections. Organizations can grow and evolve organically. And they're not always perfect in the way they can interact through mandates with other providers of credit. So if you look at in any given European country, you'll have a department responsible for dispensing aid, untied aid to African markets. You'll have another department responsible for financing export finance. And they often won't talk to each other literally separate budget allocations and it's very inefficient you don't have a whole of government approach even at a national level you then take it to the, to the multilateral level and you look at huge gaps in the delivery mechanisms for financing projects there's very few multilaterals doing the smaller projects and very few deals where you see export credit agencies of multilaterals work together what's exciting about the fund it's it's an entity around which these disparate group of players can gather around and invest because it's open platform it's not proprietary it's not trying to give one bank an advantage over its competitors like most funds are it's very much a, an open platform into which people can invest so we're seeing a mixture of people coming in from the development bank side from the private side from the from the family office from the foundation side all looking to do good in africa to ensure that ACRE delivers on its impact mandate, there is a very real requirement for due diligence. Hussein explains how this happens before any investment takes place. A lot of the projects that we focus on are greenfield projects. So a lot of the work around understanding the potential impact of the transaction is done up front as part of our impact due diligence. And there is really understanding, you know, Basically, what the project is about, what are the beneficiaries? Are they going to be able to afford the services of that particular piece of infrastructure? So let's say you're, you're, you're financing a hospital. Will the population be able to afford the services? Do they have to pay at the point of delivery? And if they do, are the services priced in such a way that the majority of the population have access? So all of these questions come into our impact assessment and ultimately help us form a view. Now, there are many ways in that people think of impact and many frameworks and methodologies out there. But we really designed the fund to be a best in class in terms of how we look at our impact due diligence. So we look at the impact management project and the framework of the impact management project to drive our due diligence requirements. And that's a broadly recognized framework that most development finance institutions and multilateral development banks use. And that's, we use well, that's what we use as a framework to uh, do our impact assessment. And then we use the Global Impact Investing Network's IRIS Plus methodology to report on impact. And that comes once the, the project has been financed and the infrastructure has been built, we then go and assess what is the actual impact and how can we measure it. So if we're financing a hospital, what proportion of the population now has improved access to healthcare? How many hospital beds have been added in a particular region or, or country? What type of services have been provided by the hospital? And ultimately, which is really hard to do in, in impact measurement, but what you'd like to get to, to is outcomes. So can you then claim, because this hospital has been financed and built, that child mortality has been reduced by a certain percentage. So all of these types of metrics and measures form part of our impact analysis and impact framework. Chris, from your point of view as the bank, what is the importance of the due diligence done with regards to social impact? We are humble bankers. We are not environmental and social specialists. And it's important that the product people in banks, in the wider industry, realize that. It's one thing having an anecdotal or amateur view on, this is bound to be socially impactful, it's a road. There wasn't a road there before. It's going to give people access to infrastructure. Well, it needs to be a bit more scientific than that. Is the road implicitly going to be good? Is the hospital implicitly going to be good if you're paying three times the amount of money you should be for it? And it's only accessible to certain members, strata of the population. So there's a number of tests you'd want to, to see deployed. And you, you want to make sure, one, when you spend the money, it's going to go to a good project. How do you determine what's good? Because the banker told you it is. 
I don't think so. And also to make sure that it actually reaches the project in the end and the project actually gets implemented. This allows you to track it right through to the end. You can guarantee all these tests. If you are enjoying this podcast, look out for other episodes where we explore more about sustainability and responsible investing and discover how the future of investment is already having real world impacts. Subscribe to Investec Focus Radio Essay wherever you get your podcasts. In 1950, a great wave of independence began to sweep across the continent of Africa. It broadly began at the northern and southern edges, and over a period of decades, more and more former colonies began to gain independence. In November 1975, one of the last countries to break the shackles of colonialism was Angola. Far from being a time of celebration though, a civil war raged for 27 years with only occasional periods of fragile peace. Officially ending in 2002, the toll of the conflict can still be seen, particularly in the healthcare sector. According to a USAID survey, child and maternal mortality rates are among the highest in the world. Almost one in five children die before their fifth birthday, and 610 out of 100,000 mothers die during childbirth. Adding to the burden on the system is widespread malaria. It's against this backdrop that the true value of export finance can be seen. Fast forward to 2022, in collaboration with the Export Credit Insurance Corporation of South Africa and Italy's Unicredit SPA, the lead arranger of the facility with Italy's Export Credit Agency, Investec successfully closed a 34 million euro deal with the Angolan Ministry of Finance, which will part finance three hospitals in the country. The three hospitals will be built in Huambo, Luena and Cabinda. The project will also benefit intra-African trade with 14 million euros in South African exports envisaged to be realized through the transaction. I am Brian Irvin and my responsibility at Investec is I look after all of these specialized lending areas for the rest of Africa. That includes the export and agency finance business, the trade finance businesses and then all the corporate lending activity. Brian begins by putting the state of healthcare in Angola into perspective. The current healthcare environment in Angola is not too different from most of the African countries, including South Africa as well. So if South Africa is a good reference point, you can just picture Baraguanath Hospital, some of the other state-owned healthcare facilities. Some of them are there, but they're not functioning as they intended to. And so there's a huge deficit, and that spans the continent. The need for improved healthcare infrastructure is so massive that, according to Brian, it can only be achieved by leveraging export finance's specific strengths, the ability to securely raise and distribute large amounts of funds from outside the continent. If we just consider the amount of tenders that are issued by the respective ministries of healthcare in these countries, it's vast. Certainly much more than we and most of the African banks collectively can deliver upon. And hence the requirement for export and agency finance support where we effectively get OECD governments to help finance and guarantee the project costs in order for these very important hospitals to be built and delivered. The total financial package for the construction of the three hospitals is 225 million euros, an amount that will deliver more than just bricks and mortar. It includes the construction of the buildings, the specialist equipment, most of which is imported, effectively delivering a final product that will be fully functional. So it's all inclusive. It also caters for insurance premiums and other financing costs that need to be built into the package as well. It's not just about completing and constructing the hospital, but they also have obligations post-construction or post-completion to make sure the facilities are maintained, the necessary specialists are attracted, doctors are trained, etc. The they Brian mentioned is Vamed, an Austrian construction firm 
with an impressive 30-year track record of over 1,000 hospitals built, many of these in Africa. In partnership with VAMED, Investec is also responsible for other aspects of the project. There's a lot of shared responsibilities like environmental impact assessment studies and action plans and making sure that there's sufficient provision that's made if people have to be, you know, resettled in different areas because the project might be built or constructed where people are already living. And so that is an obligation that we share. So it really is a trusted relationship. It's all about reputation. And I think both parties want to make sure that they deal with credible entities that will deliver. And speaking of trust, the structuring of the deal makes sure that everything that's planned on paper is in fact realized in the real world. Whilst our borrower in this instance would be the Ministry of Finance in Angola, we run the project as if it is a project financing transaction. What this means is that the construction company agrees certain milestones, and if they deliver on those milestones, we as bank control the funds. If the milestones are reached, then we pay the construction company and the suppliers directly and thus ensure that the project gets completed on time and as intended. So you don't have a situation such as you would have where the government would issue a bond, receive all of the cash up front, and then we kind of all hope that it gets spent on the right projects. It's no secret that political uncertainties remain in Africa. And events such as elections, such as Angola had just before the hospital project began, can throw even the best laid plans into disarray. But good export finance deals, such as the one governing this project, do their best to ensure transparency and to follow due process. So the agreements are duly drafted and executed, enforceability opinions, all of those normal requirements are seeked. We also make sure that the sovereign is absolutely bound by these agreements. And for that, we get various opinions, including government auditor general signing off, the attorney general signing off. We make sure procurement procedures have been followed, you know, that it all complies with the laws of the country. So the agreements are valid and binding. So unless you have a situation where for some reason there's a failed state or there's civil war or something like that, takes place. One obviously have different protection mechanisms for that, but all things being equal, because we manage all of the cash and provided they can source all of the materials, then they will build and we will pay them according to an agreed schedule, which includes government's authorization as well for each draw. The Angola project has a timeline of five years, with an expected completion date of 2027. Brian looks forward to what the hospitals will deliver to their communities. Generally, the government-owned hospitals are regional hospitals, general in nature, but it certainly does offer specific wards and specific areas of service. And to give you an example of that, infectology is anticipated in this instance. It would also have an orthopedics and a trauma ward, cardiology, maternity, pediatrics. It will also have ICU, which is obviously very important. Operating theatres, about 12 of them. The bigger one of the three is 200 beds, and then the other two are 100 beds each. So it will deliver 400 beds, and that's obviously doesn't include the daily patients who get seen and treated without having to stay necessarily over. The benefits go beyond just healthcare. Brian explains. It's like a little business on its own, so you can just imagine all parts of that needs to be serviced. So... We cater for quite a large component for local labor. So during construction, it's obviously quite high and creates a lot of employment. And even post-construction, people are still maintained to upkeep gardens, run cafeterias, there's support staff, there's logistics that need to be catered for. And then, you know, moving further into specialization areas, the doctors that are attracted to work at those hospitals and trained, sisters, nurses, ambulance drivers, It creates a lot of jobs for both in-country and then also the countries from which obviously the exports are being procured from or sourced from. And in this particular instance, we've managed to introduce a component of South African content into the project as well. And and so our fiscus would also benefit from this particular project. Can you expand a bit on that point? What we managed to do in this project, as we've done successfully in quite a few other projects across the continent, is to insist on South African content. So this means that a South African exporter 
who otherwise would not have exported to this particular project, now has an opportunity to manufacture and export, and that in itself obviously creates employment, and it benefits our fiscus as they pay for the product or the export, and that flows out directly into South Africa then. And it's not just capital goods, but it includes services as well, such as professional services. For that reason, the South African government, through its ECA, which is ECIC, are willing to support a tranche of the debt, which is very important and very necessary in order to get financial closure. So there really is a direct benefit to our fiscus, and it's a good example of African governments supporting each other. And what we've also seen as part of the requirements for the South African government to support this project is that Vomit itself sets up a business in South Africa, and they've done that now, and they will use it as a platform to build more hospitals, not only in our own country, but also in the rest of Africa. So it's, it's, it's a good long-term benefit there. For Brian, involvement in these types of export finance projects, like the one underway in Angola, also delivers a personal sense of satisfaction. What excites me about this kind of work is that we really do make a difference on the continent. We only do projects that score very highly on the ESG objectives. And so they are really impactful, you know, and whether it's healthcare or education, water projects, agricultural projects, roads, rail transactions, these are all things that enable the people on the continent. And that to me ultimately defines success because, you know, the challenge in Africa is not finding these projects. The deficit on the continent is enormous, but it's doing the right projects for the right reasons and making sure they get completed. The eventual outcome of infrastructure projects like the building of these three hospitals in Angola might be obviously beneficial and deliver impact. But for Chris, these types of projects can't always be measured simply by their end results. The very nature of large-scale construction means that there are potential grey areas and unintended consequences that need to be carefully interrogated. Well, you know, storm drains in Ghana, like that involves pouring just giant amounts of cement and concrete and steel into the ground and channeling water away from villages. Uh, that produces massive amounts of CO2, but it saves human lives. Large hydro, super large hydro, that's really incredibly environmentally destructive in the early stages of, of building, ultimately produces clean energy. Is that good or bad? So there's there's things you need to look at in the round to determine, but the idea is that the project will actually involve assessing every single deal which is done in the market at the ICC trade register and classifying it appropriately so that everyone knows what we're heading towards. This is not an opportunity to market how good you are. You know, you pick up a something in the supermarket, it says responsibly sourced, sustainable, green, Green, environmentally friendly, everything is labelled as being good for the planet and good for society, but it's clearly not. And it's, it's not an acceptable approach to business to do it that way. To help future investors and investments clarify just what impact is being made and how much, Chris and Hussein, as part of a team comprising members from 16 leading banks, the Rockefeller Foundation and the International Chamber of Commerce, or ICC, drafted a white paper entitled Sustainability in Export Finance. The idea behind the award-winning white paper was to provide an overview of the industry and how to improve impact outcomes in export credit finance. We've got 35 odd major export credit agencies and the same number of banks all doing their own thing when it comes to sustainability. And no one knows what the others are doing. Different standards are being adopted, different approaches are being adopted. And what we thought would be really helpful was to take a giant Polaroid picture of what everyone's doing in the market and hold a mirror up to the market and say, look, this is what you guys look like. And the idea was to empower action so everyone can see what each other are doing the good and the bad, put a percentage on the number of good deals being done every year, tell people who's doing this over here, this one stopped doing coal, this one's doing no more oil and gas. It took nine months to write the report. And in writing the report, it started the industry conversation. I mean, the production of the report was as influential as the report's publishing and advocacy subsequently. And it helped lead the conversation. And I think that what I can say to you absolutely categorically is that a massive sea change has taken place 
Since the publication of the report, the OECD announced a cessation of the financing of unabated coal-fired power projects. A massively important step in the right direction. Multiple export credit agencies have now individually announced cessation of support for financing of coal, oil and gas projects. Seven European governments have set up something called Export Finance for the Future. It's called E3F. It's quite a cool name. Export Finance for the Future. The Bern Union, which is the umbrella industry body for all export credit agencies, has also formed a climate action group. Our work hasn't stopped since the white paper is published. It's actually got harder because now you have to do advocacy work and try to say what we can actually do to push some of these initiatives forward. And pushing forward by incorporating new lenders and consolidating resources where possible is something that gets both Chris and Hussein excited about what's achievable through export finance. My heart and my passion is around helping countries develop essential infrastructure and ultimately deliver key services. You know, one of the reasons that we founded Acre Impact Capital was to find a way and an innovative solution to provide infrastructure financing in a way that is responsible, that provides attractive uh, financing to the borrowers and that can really deliver impact at scale and try to channel institutional capital into a space where they're not usually or haven't historically been very active. And the multiplier effects are, are significant. I mean, depending on who you believe, there are estimates from McKinsey, the IMF, etc., that every dollar invested in infrastructure has a long-term benefit for the GDP growth of the country that is multiples of, of the dollars invested. That is uh, exactly why we focus on, on that infrastructure space, because by providing this sort of building blocks um, of infrastructure and that allows businesses to flourish, citizens to flourish, and ultimately the economy to grow. Thanks for listening to this episode of Investec Focus Radio's Future Impact. In our final episode, we look at how you as an individual can find your own personal impact that contributes towards the success of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. A lot of people don't know what they can do about it. They don't think that individuals have any kind of power or impact in this space, but individuals still have the power to create change. So through collective actions, individuals can actually make a big impact. If you're not yet subscribed, you can find us by searching for Investec Focus Radio Essay wherever you get your podcasts. Please don't forget to rate us if you've enjoyed this conversation. Until next time, farewell from me, Seven Zilin Gambule, and the Focus Radio team. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Corporate and Institutional Banking, a division of Investec Bank Limited, an authorized financial services provider, a registered credit provider, an authorized over-the-counter derivatives provider, and a member of the JSE. Investec is committed to the code of banking practice as regulated by the Ombudsman for Banking Services.